Um, a big part of uh, this issue is our inability to stand in another's shoes uh, with an open mind to understand a different worldview. In this regard, can each of you tell us which of your opponent's arguments is the most convincing? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, admirable th- question. Thank you for it. Um, the uh, remark Tony made that I most agreed with this evening, I'll just hope that doesn't sound too minimal, was when he said that if religion was to disappear, things would by no means, as it were, automatically be okay. I mean, he phrased it better than that. And it would be what I regard as a necessary condition would certainly not be a sufficient one. In any way, religion won't disappear. I just think the hold of it on people's minds can be substantially broken and domesticated. Um, He's quite right about that, of course. Um, I hope I didn't seem at any point to have argued to the contrary. I come before you, after all, as a materialist. If we give up religion, we discover what actually we know already, whether we're religious or not, which is that we are somewhat imperfectly evolved primates on a very small planet in a very unimportant suburb of the of a solar system that is itself a negligible part of a very rapidly expanding and blowing apart uh, cosmic phenomenon. These conclusions to me are a great deal more awe-inspiring than what's contained in any burning bush or <laughs> horse that flies overnight to Jerusalem or any other of that. It's a great deal more awe-inspiring as is any look through the Hubble telescope at what our real nature and future really is. So he was quite right to say that, and I would have been entirely wrong if I'd implied otherwise. I think I could say a couple of things for religion myself would, in fact. First is what I call the apotropaic. We all have it, the desire not to be found claiming all the credit. A certain kind of modesty, you could almost say humility. Um, People will therefore say they'll thank God when something happens that they are grateful for. Or There's no need to make this a religious thing. The Greeks had the concept of hubris as something to be avoided and criticized. But I, what, I, what the Greeks would also have called the aperitropaic, the, the, the view that not all the glory can be claimed by a load of primates like ourselves, is a healthy reminder too. Second, the sense that there's something beyond the material, or if not beyond it, Um, not entirely consistent materially with it is, I think, a very important matter. What you could call the numinous or the transcendent or, at its best, I suppose, the ecstatic. Um, I wouldn't trust anyone in this hall who didn't know what I was talking about. We know what we mean by it um, when we think about certain kinds of music perhaps certainly the, the relationship or the coincidence but sometimes very powerful between music and love um, landscape uh, certain kinds of artistic um, and creative work that appears not to have been done entirely by hand without this uh, we really would merely be uh, primates I think it's very important to, to appreciate the, the finesse of that and I think religion has done a very good job in enshrining it in music and in architecture not so much in painting, in my opinion. And I think it's actually very important that we learn to distinguish the numinous um, in this way. I wrote a book about the Parthenon. I'll mention it briefly. I couldn't live without the Parthenon. I don't believe any civilized person could. If it was to be destroyed, you'd feel something much worse than the destruction of the first temple had occurred, it seems to me. But um, and what, we've lost an enormous amount besides by way of our knowledge of symmetry and grace and, and harmony. Um, but I don't care about the cult of Pallas Athena. It's gone. And as far as I know, it's not to be missed. The Eleusinian mysteries have been demystified. The, the sacrifices, some of them human, that were made to those gods uh, are regrettable but have been blotted out and forgotten. And Athenian imperialism is also a thing of the past. What remains is the fantastic beauty and the faith that built it. The question is well, how to keep what is of value of this sort in, in art and in our own emotions and in our finer feelings, the numinous, the transcendent, I'll go as far as the ecstatic, and to distinguish it precisely from superstition and the supernatural, which are designed to make us fearful and afraid and servile, and which sometimes succeed only too well. Thank you. Um, 
I just wanted to pick up something, if, if, if I might, that, that uh, Christopher said, because I thought his, his discussion of the transcendent was very interesting, actually. I mean, for those of us of religious faith, we, um, we acknowledge and, and, and believe that there is a power higher and separate from human power. Um, and in a way, what Christopher is saying is, well, I, don't, I can't accept that, but I do accept there is, there is something transcendent in the human experience and something numinous, something even um, the, ecstatic. You see, f- for me, the, it, the belief in, in, a, in a higher power and the fact that we should be a, a, obedient to the will of, of that power, not simply our own will, I don't regard that as putting me in a position of, of civility is not the word I would use. I would use the word obligation. And, you know, when I, it, it, it is of course absolutely true that when I can point to any of the, the acts that I say are inspired by religious faith, you can say, well, they could easily have been inspired by, by humanism. But I think that for those of us that are of faith and, and do believe that, um, that there is something actually more than simply the, the, the human power, this does give you, I think, a humility. It's not all that can give you a humility, but it does. I think, and I have witnessed this myself, I remember actually again to refer to Northern Ireland when I um, met some of the people who were um, the relatives of those who died in the Oma bombing, which came actually after the Good Friday Agreement and was the, the worst terrorist a- attack in the hi- history of Northern Ireland. And I went to, to visit uh, the relatives of the victims, and I remember a man saying to me um, that who, who, who had lost uh, his loved one in, 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 the, in the bombing, saying to me, you know, I have prayed about this, and... I want you to know that this terrible act should make you all the more determined to reach peace and to not stop your quest for peace. And it is completely true that, of course, he could have come to such an extraordinary and, I would say, transcendent view of forgiveness and um, um, uh, compassion um, without religious faith. But it was what led him to that. And so I think you can't ignore the fact that for many of us, actually religious faith is what shapes us in this direction. And not because we are servile or base our our religious faith on superstition or contrary to reason, indeed. Uh, Which is why I've never seen a contradiction between Darwin and, and being someone of religious faith. But we do genuinely believe that it impels us in a way that is, 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 is different and more imperative, in a sense, um, than anything else in our lives. And, you know, in a way, we wouldn't be being true to ourselves unless we, we admitted that. So that doesn't mean to say that someone who is of no religious faith couldn't be just as good a person, and that is, I do not claim for an instant that anybody who is religious, of, of religious faith is in some way um, a superior or better person than someone who isn't. But I do say that religion can and does in the lives of millions, actually hundreds of millions, in fact billions of people, does give them an impulse to be better people than otherwise they would be. I think a way I might do it actually is by commenting on what, on what Tony just said because he succeeded in doing what I had hoped I might get him to do earlier, which is to allow me me to drive him back onto the territory of metaphysics with which I began, because we did need to transcend that and thus to get beyond questions like, well, are religious people good, are they bad, and uh, other things that are very important. Does religion make them behave better or worse, and so forth. Um, I'll give you, uh, and I'll challenge Tony on an example, I mentioned earlier our our attachment to the labor and uh, socialist movement in our our lifetimes. For a very long time, 
we had in that movement a challenger, apparently from the left, um, the communist movement, which has only been dead a very short time now, actually hasn't died everywhere yet, and which said it had a much more comprehensive and courageous and thoroughgoing answer than we did to the problems created by capitalism and imperialism and other things, and really proposed a fighting solution. And if I was to point to you the number of heroic people who believed in that, and the number of wonderful works of, of uh, especially of fiction, um, novels and essays written by people who believed in it, you, you, you could probably all of you mention uh, one of your own. If you were a Canadian, I hope they still teach about him in school, the great example of, of Norman Bethune, heroic doctor who went to volunteer in China during the Civil War on the communist side, uh, did amazing work, invented a, a form of battlefield blood transfusion. Uh, just one among many examples. It was the communists in many parts of Europe who barred the road to fascism in Spain and uh, felt kept Madrid for many years from falling to Franco and Hitler and Mussolini. Gandhi may take credit for the Indian independence movement, too much in my view, but no one would deny the tremendous role played by the Indian communists in doing this, in, in, in helping to break the challenge, break, me, break the hold of Great Britain on, on their country. Um, as a matter of fact, some people find it embarrassing to concede this, but I don't, as a supporter of it myself, the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela's party, at least half of its members of the Central Committee and the Executive were, were members of the Communist Party until quite recently, very probably including Mandela himself. There's no doubt about it. There was real heroism and dignity and humanism to those people, but we opposed it. We said, no, it won't work. Why won't it work? It's not worth the sacrifice of freedom that it implies. It implies that all these great things can only be done if you'll place yourself under an infallible leadership. Uh, one that, once it's made a decision, has made that decision and you are bound by it. You might conceivably notice where I'm going here. Um, <laughs> it's why many of the people, the brilliant intellectuals who did leave it, left it very often for as, as high reasons of principle as they joined it in the first place. And the names of their books are legion and legendary. The best known is called The God That Failed. Uh, precisely because it was an attempt at a bogus form, a surrogate of religion. But let no one say, and when the history comes to be written, no one will be able to say that it didn't represent some high points in human history. But I repeat, it wasn't worth it at the sacrifice of mental and intellectual and moral freedom. And that was the purpose of my original set of questions on the metaphysical side. Are you, consider yourselves and consider this carefully, ladies and gentlemen, brothers, sisters, comrades, friends. Are you, are you yourselves willing, for the sake of certain elements of the numinous, perhaps for a, a great record of good works, as it's proposed by Tony, are you willing to say that you give your allegiance to an ultimate redeemer? Because you're not really religious if you don't believe that there is a divine supervision Involved. You don't have to believe it intervenes all the time. If you don't believe that, you're already halfway out the door. You don't need me. <laughs> but are you willing to pay the price of a permanent supervisor? Are you willing to pay the price of believing in things that are supernatural? Um, miracles, uh, afterlives, uh, angels. Are you willing to admit, perhaps this most of all, are you willing to admit that human beings can be the interpreter of this divine figure? Because a religion means that you will have to follow someone who is your religious leader. You can't try as you may follow Jesus of Nazareth. It can't be done. You can try and do it, it can't be done. You'll have to follow his vicar on earth, Pope Benedict XXVI as presently. The, his own claim, not mine. The apostolic succession, the vicar of Christ on earth. You'll have to say, this person has divine authority. I maintain that that and what goes with it is too much of a sacrifice of the mental and intellectual freedom that is essential to us to be tolerated. And you gain everything by repudiating that and standing up to your own full height. And you gain much more than you will by pretending that you're a member of a flock or in any other way, any kind of sheep. Thank you.